He has served as a member of Wycliffe Bible Translators since 1976. He and his wife Linda worked for 27 years in Asia, both in Bible translation ministry to the Yahweh people of Indonesia and in missionary leadership. He served in senior leadership of the Seed Company since 2008 and is currently the Senior Vice President for Bible Translation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jones. Thank you, Adam. I'm sure I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. I was commenting to uh, uh, Dr. White, who will follow me, how hard it's, it's going to be to back clean up for uh, a, a, uh, such a strong series of presentations. So, you know, this has been uh, rich for me, and I'm, I'm sure it has been for all of you who have been a part of it as well. Uh, Several of them have asked me, uh, you know, what is the seed company? How is it related to Wycliffe? I'll give you just, I'll give you the elevator version of that. It does, it does pertain to our discussion today, and so it, it may be a help. In the, uh, you know, the, the way that the Bible translators was conceived as, uh, originally as a way of sending missionary Bible translators, highly skilled, highly trained people in Bible translation from North America and Europe to the nations, wherever it was that people needed to have us have scripture, and uh, they were involved in translating scripture for those uh, people groups in partnership with local speakers, uh, much as, uh, as Dr. Bruno mentioned earlier, earlier today. The, uh, the, and the entire economic model of Wycliffe was based on those missionary translators raising support from churches and individuals, and that salary came in, there was a portion of it given the organization, and the rest was what the, the, the missionaries lived on. That was the way in which Wycliffe uh, worked for many, many years. The challenge came in the 1980s when uh, increasingly, uh, due to the changing demographic of the uh, global church, uh, missionary translators were going into areas of Africa and to some extent in Asia, and they were encountering individuals who spoke the languages that they wanted to translate but those individuals had the kind of uh, education and spiritual motivation that really qualified them to take the lead in the Bible translation task. They needed some training, they needed some funding. And uh, the problem was that at that time, in the 1980s, there was no funding for such people within the local context. All the funding was either supporting the missionaries who embraced it or it was keeping the, the doors of the organization open. And so the seed company was uh, created in the early 1990s and as a direct request from the international boards of Wycliffe and SIL to call it with a, a plea, find a way, find a way for uh, generous giving partners to support Bible translators from Africa or Asia so that they can continue this work. Uh, and, and so the, the, that was part of how the seed company was started. It was started as a way in which uh, generous giving partners in North America, in the United States primarily uh, in, in, in the early days, could connect up with a Bible translation project and give generously to support a Bible translation project that was being done by an African uh, into his own language or an Asian man or woman in the her, his or her own language. That's how the seed company got started. That continues to be our reason for existence, uh, uh, both as a, as a funding channel, a partner to make, to make those uh, projects work, and also, in my case, I'm involved in uh, uh, leading a group of translation consultants who can Google training translators, and also assist uh, those translators to make sure their work is, is done accurately and faithfully. Uh, so the, 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 that uh, notion that the world has changed, and that the role of a North American uh, you know, servant of God in the Bible translation task today is different than it was 50 years ago, is, is probably at the centerpiece of what I want to talk about this, this afternoon. I'm, very, I'm, I'm passionate about this particular uh, uh, issue that is, I think, very closely related to what some of the, our, our other colleagues have talked about. I think it, it ties very well into what Perry talked about just uh, a, little, a little bit ago. But the, uh, the title of the presentation, Bible Translation in the 21st Century, Recasting the Relationship of the Bible Agencies and the Global Church. The Bible agencies are those who have, have focused you know, uh, specifically on the translation of the Bible, its publication and distribution, 
And the global church is the bigger is the bigger body. It's the body of all those who believe in the Lord Jesus around the world. Everybody's numbers will shift around a little bit, so this, this, these are broad strokes. But if you look at what the remaining need is for Bible translation in the world today, uh, a few big figures. One of them, uh, 1,900, that's roughly the number of languages that remain that have no scripture whatsoever in them. Uh, that, that 19, uh, yeah, the, the person who represents that, a person from Amazonia in Brazil, uh, represents a, a, a also the fact that the vast majority of those languages, probably 1,500 of them, are spoken by speakers of 10,000 or less. There are, they're very small languages, and they those have unique challenges uh, in terms of what we need to do to serve those people groups well, to bring God's message, reliable message to them in the language of their hearts. Uh, there are about 2,000 pe uh, people groups who currently are in process. And it, it, somebody has committed to translating scripture into those languages. Uh, it may be in cooperation with the Bible agency. It may be a church denomination or a mission agency of some other kind. But we've got something going on in about 2,000 languages around the world today where, where a people group is on the path towards getting some scripture in, uh, in their language. In addition, uh, there are, uh, and really it's an indeterminate number of uh, languages that have New Testaments that are going to need an Old Testament. The actual number of languages with the New Testament is much larger than the 600 I have there. It's quite a lot larger. It's uh, probably close to 2,000, if I'm not mistaken. Is that, is that in, in my ballpark? Okay. The reason I've been conservative here because not every translation of the, of the New Testament into a language that, that, that exists is currently being used. There are, are you know, quite a number of probably that are not being used for a variety of different reasons. Lack of literacy, uh, uh, a language change, uh, people are moving towards another language. And so for whatever reason, there are translations that are sitting in boxes. And I don't think anyone's done a thorough study of exactly how many of those translations exist that way. So this is a very conservative estimate. But I, I, uh, my, my own uh, conviction on this, as, as someone who, who works closely with a, in, in a, a, a missional endeavor that connects giving partners with God's global mission, is that I don't want to go to a giving partner and ask them to support the translation of the scripture three times the length of the New Testament. If, if the people group that has the New Testament is not using it. If it's not being used, if the New Testament that they've got isn't being used, I can't go to somebody and say, please support the translation of the Old Testament for this group. If it's being used, then they need all of it. They need, then they need the whole council of God. Absolutely. So I'm saying roughly, you know, I, I would say 600 is a, is a, uh, a uh, conservative estimate of how many Old Testaments that are out there that really ought to be translated uh, for, for people uh, at, at, at this point. So that leaves 4,500 round figures again. But that's the, that's the need. That, that sounds big, but it sounds small also. But it's really not all that many uh, considering God's global resources. So the historic role of the Bible agencies, this, is a, uh, this picture it doesn't have anything to do with the Bible, but it has something to do with that kind of a relationship. It's a, uh, the product that uh, my, uh, the company that my son uh, uh, owns produces, one of the products. The, uh, it's a, you know, a cathedology produces uh, uh, attachments for coffee making equipment for connoisseurs. This is a steel mesh filter for an Aeropress coffee maker. And uh, when this first was conceived and designed, uh, Nate and his wife, Charity, produced them by hand and sold them. And sold them on Amazon, sold them on the website. And when, that, when it became so popular that they could not keep up, then they, uh, they contracted with a factory in Houghton, Ohio, which, met, which makes these to Nate and Charity's specifications. And they sell them. And, uh, yeah, they, and the, the uh, vendor is the factory, and the customer who's getting those products to sell to, their, uh, yeah, to the public uh, are, is the technology company, it's my, my son's company. Now, the Bible translation agencies and, and, and have served as a vendor for the church and mission agencies for many, many years. Uh, they have been specialists who produce, who have supervised the production of Bible translations 
four people groups around the world. And the church uh, has, you know, this is particularly true with the larger, uh, uh, with the Bible societies, which won't ever make any move towards the Bible translation without the request of the church. The church requests it, they will, they, they will help facilitate, provided that they have the, the uh, funding to help facilitate the translation of scripture for that people group. So the Bible agencies, especially the translation agencies, are, uh, uh, have been in a, a, a service mode with the, uh, uh, with the wider global church. The church says, I would like a translation into this language. The Bible translation agencies have stepped in and have since sought to do that uh, in a, uh, a customer vendor relationship. And what that means then is that uh, the, the, the Bible agencies have been a a trusted, independent affirmation of the fidelity of the translation. That's one of the things that the, that, that the services that the Bible translation agencies have provided over the years. Uh, if, if the, uh, if the uh, translation agency, whether it was Wycliffe, one of the United Bible Society affiliates, said this is a faithful translation, then that, that, that gave confidence. It gave confidence to a whole cluster of people. And, and groups. Uh, the, the people group needed to have the confidence that they didn't want a translation that was inaccurate. The wider church in that, in, in that nation, when they were, uh, yeah, it, it, there's often, you know, we, we often think about Bible translation in a rather atomistic way, specific translations here and there. And really, Bible translation has been in a context. It's in a, it comes in a national context. There are large Christian groupings, whether they are denominations that, are, that also have a stake. There are mission agencies, sometimes international mission agencies, that also have a stake in those translations. And so the, the wider church at large also wanted to have, wants to have, have confidence that the translation is accurate and faithful. And the involvement of the Bible agency has been one way historically that that's been able to happen. And then uh, 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 in, in, in addition, the publishers. The publishers want to have confidence that what they're publishing is a, is a, a faithful and accurate translation. They, 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 uh, a, a Christian publisher, uh, by the or whoever, does, would, would, does not want to publish a translation that uh, creates a cult you know, in, the worst, uh, in the worst scenario. And so they, they want to know that that translation is faithful and accurate. So that's what the Bible agencies have done over the years, is have had this kind of a role in, uh, in, in the global cause of the kingdom around the world in missions. But what, there has been a historic result of that, and that is that the Bible translation agencies have sort of functioned uh, as a guild uh, uh, where, where there, there are specialists who are able to handle this task, who are approved or certified to handle it, and they're the ones that do that. And then everyone else uh, is, uh, is on the outside, in a sense, and they can pray and they can give, but they aren't really supposed to personally touch this because it's only for the specialists. That's the community, you know, whether it's implicit or sometimes explicitly, that's the message that the Bible translation agencies have given to the global church. So, so the, you know, it's a, a trade union kind of mentality where, where we are certified to do this, and everyone else, we will do it for you, but, 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 but you, you can't handle this. That's the kind of a message that's out there. That's unfortunate. I don't think it's a, that, that's, a, that's a good thing, but that certainly has been the historic result of, uh, of the, the work of the, of the agencies and the interaction between the Bible translation agencies and the uh, wider church. And there's a problem with that, and uh, Dr. Oates mentioned it, and that is that that the, currently the rise in the number of Bible translation projects that are being started and conducted today is unprecedented. Never in the history of God's people have so many people groups been involved with Bible translation if it's as many different languages as there are today. And that far outstrips, it far outstrips the Bible agency's capacity to, to effectively support it uh, with all of the, the mechanisms that were built for a, a, in a sense, for a smaller, more manageable enterprise. The, the enterprise has grown. It's grown beyond the boundaries of any uh, a Bible agency uh, or, or even all the Bible agencies combined. The push and the hunger for God's word globally is far greater 
than, uh, yeah, than ever before. And so that is a, is, is a phenomenon. Glory to God that, it's, it, that, that uh, we live in that day. But it does mean that it presents issues and challenges for, for the way in which Bible translation has been done uh, historically. You know, we, we, uh, the, the system has inadequacies, and we are, and, and several uh, of the presentations here are we're all poking at the same problem. How will we address the inadequacy of the, of the capacity of the current system to support Bible translation uh, in, uh, as it goes forward? This trend line is only going to get, uh, is only going to continue to accelerate. Uh, it's, if there's no indication of it peaking out or cresting. I think we will continue to see more and more people groups being involved in Bible translation uh, for, uh, for their own languages and finding ways to support them and help them to be successful is the main thing that we're, that we're trying to, uh, uh, to address. And so, and, and that's the, the focus of, uh, of uh, my, uh, my comments today. This is a picture that those of you from Louisiana will appreciate. <laughs> The populist alternative. There is a, you know, it, what I have seen as I look uh, and have interacted with, with uh, churches, denominations all over the world, there is a, a measure of impatience because of the number of Bible translation projects that are being started in different places and a restlessness that the current system it, it makes things too slow. People have to wait too long for help uh, if they get help at all. There's a restlessness, and they're saying we need to move forward. We don't want to wait. I don't know how many times in the course of my uh, you know, missionary career in Asia, I was work I worked with colleagues, mission colleagues from a variety of different international mission agencies who, who would say, please hurry up and get your job done. We want those translations. And, uh, and, and uh, the, 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 I got tired of saying, please be, take, be patient. This is a complicated job, which it is. <laughs> but, it's, but nevertheless, the, the, the dynamic and the pressure of, uh, of a growing church and a passion for the Great Commission is, makes that message an inadequate one. And, and we need to start looking at, well, how can we? What can we do differently? And one of the things, one of the, uh, the, the ideas is a, a power to the people kind of movement where uh, a, a, you know, the, the people group themselves uh, say, we have, a, you know, this is our responsibility. Uh, we, you know, it's our language. We own this enterprise. And uh, this is what, uh, you know, th th this is not something that outsiders, you know, can or should control. It's something that we are going to do. And that's a that's a, uh, a very compelling kind of a, uh, of, a of a message. It's a message that that uh, resonates, I think, with people who have uh, felt marginalized, uh, who have felt disempowered by the global situation. There are those who uh, uh, feel like, like like those of us in the West have been in control of most everything for a real long time. And they, they desire to, to grab control of this themselves and say, we can do this. We can do this. And we don't need permission. We don't need anybody else to control it. So there's a, you know, there, there's an anti-colonial dimension to that rhetoric. And, the, and there's, you know, there's a, a, an understandable sentiment that pulls uh, people groups towards this, uh, pulls churches, local churches towards it. Uh, so I think we need to look at that honestly and see the merits of it and also see the dangers of it and well, how can we work with it in order to capture the, the impetus and the power and the energy of that for God's glory and in a way that, that produces good and accurate translations. Some of the strengths of the, uh, of the, of the populist alternative, certainly it involves the end users. One of the, of the challenges with, that I mentioned earlier about New Testaments that aren't used one of the reasons that they, uh, that, that they are not used is that to the extent that they were produced as a product that was handed to a people group, then it's something that, that they can take or leave. If they didn't create it themselves, if somebody else created it and gave it to them, well, they, then they can, you know, there, there is a sense in which they can uh, decide, yeah, yes or no, I'm interested or I'm not. If, but if they produce it themselves, the odds that they're going to use it is far greater. So the idea of end-user involvement and ownership from the very beginning is a very positive thing about this. 
There's also a measure of, uh, of timeliness and rapidity. They can produce things more quickly if they, you know, it would, between the energy that they're putting into it because of their own passion, if they own it, they're pushing forward uh, as rapidly as they can, and they're they're trying to harness their own resources to, to cover all the bases. It can it can be done more quickly, and then all this leads to I think to, to more vigorous use of the translated text at the end of the day. They they will, they are are eager to to use what they what they have produced uh, by their own energies through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I think those are really good things that we want to say, that we can celebrate with regard to the populist alternative for, that, for uh, moving forward on Bible translation. We want to find ways of retaining those and capitalizing on them. There are some weaknesses that I'd like to at least just point out and uh, reflect with you on. One of them has to do with this whole notion of where meaning resides. In the philosophy of language, as your, your professors talk about hermeneutics and talk about uh, inspiration and so forth, one of the, of the, of the classic debates within the philosophy of language languages where the meaning of the text resides. Uh, be a, some philosophers would say the, the meaning of the text is what the author meant it to say. And others would say, on the other end of the spectrum, would say the only meaning of that text happens when a reader or someone interacts with it. And then the meaning that they derive from it is the meaning of the text. You know, that, that's the communication act that's important. Now, those of us who, uh, you know, as, as, as people who have founded our lives on Scripture, our, and we have founded our eternal destiny on the message of, this, of Scripture, we have a, a lot at stake in where we land on that particular question. Because God uh, has put a message that he wants all of us to respond to in in scripture. And so while there is a dynamic with regard to communi uh, the communication act and the interaction of someone with scripture, there is without question, I think, in, implicit in our understanding of revelation that God had an intent. He has a message that we are to respond to. And it has authority over us. It has authority over the church. It shapes our faith and practice. And so that message is in the text, regardless of what anyone thinks about it when they read it. It's there. It's there because God put it there. That is an extremely important thing for us to recognize. And that's part of what, what to me, I, I struggle with and I've interacted with my partners who have, 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 uh, have wanted to, to lean hard into the, uh, to the notion that, that the people group decides when it's ready, when it's accurate. I say, where does, you know, where does, uh, do we have a, any kind of, a, of an independent reference about what the accuracy of this text is, uh, of this translation? Is it a, uh, that there's a, a sense in which, you know, it, it, they could be saying, well, what it means to me is what it means, and that's what's in the text. And that's okay. I, it's my text, I can do what I want to with it. That's, and I, I would like for us to, 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 to somehow balance that that need for uh, local user involvement and leadership to also have some dimension of recognition that there is a message in the text that stands independent of the, of the reading and understanding of the, uh, of the people group and that that message ought to be somehow guarded and make sure that that's, that that's clear and accurate. Some of those that have talked about, uh, about the uh, advent of the digital age and the ability to easily edit and change. They've said, well, we can, we can produce whatever we produce, and even if it's just 50% accurate, that's better than nothing, and we'll just make it better the next time. We'll keep on making it better you know, at, on each iterative publication. Uh, and there is a, you know, I have used that argument, actually, on, with, you know, with some people that I, uh, who have been writing resources for Bible translators that I, that I, that, who are rather perfectionistic. And we prefer not to release uh, until it's perfect. And I keep saying, we can always change it. <laughs> it's just let it get out there, let people use it. And then we'll, we'll make it better the next time. That's OK for some things. It's a little problematic uh, for scripture if something is released early uh, and, and given, the authority, given the authority within the church that this is a, uh, this is God's message on which, on which you can rest your faith and practice. If it is presented, and if it's not presented, this is a draft, 
we're still working on it. But once it's kind of, it comes out as a, an authoritative translation of God's word, then all of a sudden things solidify. People, people get attached to the text in remarkable ways. Uh, you know, the, the, the history of uh, in the English language, you know, that people were attached to the King James Version long after common English language usage had departed from it. And it was a long time before the, the English-speaking church was able to begin to introduce versions that were, clo that, that were closer to the way we speak uh, today. That's true for many like, uh, uh, languages around the world. I was talking just the other day with somebody from India and uh, who, who said that the Tamil version actually is uh, well over 100 years old, probably 150 years old, and it is, uh, it, it is in desperate need of revision. It's, it's not well understood by speakers of the language. The Indian Bible Society has attempted to produce and circulate new versions, new translations that are much better translations of, uh, of the Bible in, in the Tamil language, and the church does not want them. It systematically rejects them because they have affection for the, you know, the, the tried and true historic translation on which their church has been based for generations. They're not, they're not interested in looking at any other translation for their church practice. That's, that's what happens with holy books. <laughs> when people put their faith their eternal destiny on, their, on, the, on, a, on the message in a holy book, they don't want people messing with it. It's, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. So for that reason, we can't easily move to a situation where we can tell people, you know, that, you know, it, yes, base your faith on this, but we also want the option of changing it. Uh, and, and, and <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's problematic. Problematic to say the least. And then finally, uh, you, they, there is some risk of things uh, becoming denominational Bibles. Often, uh, the champion for a Bible translation in a particular people group is a particular mission or a particular church. Not everybody, just one particular group uh, within that. And so they, it can result in a text that only one particular group wants to use. This particular case, as you probably know, the Jerusalem Bible is a Catholic Bible. It's not used except for a reference uh, by, by any other denomination. It's used by the Roman Catholics. It's approved by them. You can have denominational Bibles, and that, that's regrettable because I'm not saying in the end the Bible belongs to all of God's people, and it would be preferable if the translations that are used in a people group could be used by all of God's people within it that speak that language. That's, that would be a preference uh, if, yeah, if, it could, if it could happen. So the church actually has been in the work of Bible translation uh, before the Bible agencies and, and has been pretty effective at it. Uh, Martin Luther, the C. Jerome, uh, William Tyndale, and, uh, and John Wycliffe were, were the two that were involved uh, in, uh, in sort of getting the, the English language translation started. Uh, and I, you know, we could go on, there are others. But these people, none of them, these were, these were pre-Bible agencies. These were not professional in the sense of trained translators, but there are people who are church people who have a passion for God's word and translated into the, into the languages. So as I think about what the, what the Bible agencies need to do in the 21st century to partner with God's global church that's changed so rapidly, uh, what, where do we need to position ourselves in relation to that? Well, a couple of different things. First of all, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, with when I looked at the, at the total remaining translation week, 1,500 more or less. That is a business when you think about God, global resources, financial and human resources that are, that are out there who could be involved in this task. That is a tiny, tiny uh, uh, amount of remaining work, really. Uh, God's, God's people have the resources to do this in a timely way, and to do it very, very well. But one of the things that the, uh, that, that, that the Bible agencies need to do is they need to reposition themselves. Instead of being a gatekeeper that says, we're the ones that do this, and the rest of you just pray and please give to us. Uh, instead, they need to open doors and say, please, please be involved. Please come join us. There are, are lots of ways that God's people can be involved in this, and that's, that's what we are, are wanting to see. 
But the Bible agencies can also be that extra pair of eyes. You know, it, it's, Bible translation is a scholarly work. As, as scholars uh, who are involved with, uh, with writing papers, publications, it is a best practice. Whenever I have written something for publication, I pass it on to other people to look at. And they tell me what they think. And the ones that just nod their head and say, how wonderful, they have not helped me. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that tell me what's wrong, they're the ones whose input I value the most. And that's true for a Bible translation as well. The translators desire honest evaluation that helps that translation be better. And so the Bible agencies do bring something to the table, but the translators very, very much want in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to do this well. C Company has a program, it's about five years old now, called the Guest Bible Scholar Program. And this is one way in which the uh, church has been involved. We actually have a couple of guest Bible scholars here, both Dr. White and Dr. Harwood, have been involved in this, uh, in, in this uh, project to involve uh, Bible scholars in North America in the, uh, in the cause of Bible translation and giving them the skills to help them learn how to help a translation team check their work for accuracy. Uh, the, the gentleman uh, on the right is uh, Dr. Pat May. He's a Bible professor at the Turner University in East Texas. And uh, he was trained uh, by a, uh, his mentor. The lady on the, on the left is uh, Dr. Katie Barnwell. And Katie uh, uh, invited Pat to go with her to Nigeria over his summer break and uh, spend a month or so there, uh, sitting alongside her, watching her check the translation and uh, being invited to help her do that under her supervision. He uh, started that a number of years ago and has made pretty much annual trips since then to a particular people group in Nigeria, assisting the translators, giving them counsel and coaching. And uh, under, under Katie's supervision, she does not, yeah, he's, he is not uh, a, a lone ranger by any means, but he is partnering along with her. She, she doesn't sit next to him every single minute, but she's available to him and she helps him be, uh, make sure that, that, that his, his service uh, serves that people group well. Uh, this is a, a fairly recent phenomenon in a group of Bible scholars in uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, we had a, uh, a, a consultant uh, from Northern Ireland who had the idea that he could train a number of people there uh, to help him by reviewing the uh, uh, back translations of, uh, of, of uh, work that he was responsible for, and uh, they were very enthusiastic in terms of their willingness to volunteer their time and go through a fairly rigorous training program to become able to give, give him the kind of feedback that he wanted and save, save some time, enables him to serve more people groups more effectively. This is actually the, the kind of interaction that I'm sure I'll be remembering, you know, that, that uh, Dr. Wright will leverage on this in his, uh, in his remarks later on. <coughs> I knew Toronto. This man is a hero. You won't ever hear about, uh, about him probably uh, anywhere else, but I need to tell you a little bit of his story. He, has a, he had, uh, uh, had a doctorate of theology from the most prestigious university in Indonesia, comes from Kupang on the island of Timor. Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Rano was the head of the largest Protestant denomination in Indonesia for about five years. He's also a pastor, also a a, a professor of theology at, at his denomination seminary. Very accomplished man. And in, in Indonesia, the normal retirement age for such people is 60. So I met Ayub when he was about 61 and uh, invited him, if he wanted to, to sit next to me when I began to check uh, a translation of Luke into a language, one of the languages of the island of Timor, Indonesia. Uh, a number of things were very interesting about this, this whole phenomenon. As I sat there and listened, there are several things I recognized. He was a speaker of another Timorese language. So he had a, intuitively a lot of understanding of how phraseology was going to be working and how, how Timorese languages were going, to, were going to have to talk about these key theological comments, or concepts. He also spoke Indonesian far better than I did. So his interaction with, uh, you know, with the translators was very, uh, very fluent and easy. He set them at ease. They were able to, to, to make really good progress. And so it was a joy for, for I and I to serve together this, uh, this 
uh, this particular uh, people group, uh, I mean, instead of translators. We checked Luke, and this first time, I did 23 chapters, and then I asked him to do to prepare and lead the conversation on chapter 24. He watched for 23 chapters and learned and, and made a few comments along the way. Did a great job uh, on, on helping the translation team check chapter 24. A few months later, we did it again, and we split it about half and half. I did 12 chapters, he did 12 chapters. I sat with him through every chapter, watched what he did. I made my comments, he watched what I did. Uh, he was a quick study. He learned very, very well. He did one more synoptic gospel. I think it was a Matthew, and he had another team with his language. And then at that point, we said, well, you know, I, the next time we have a synoptic gospel in this part of the world that needs checking, we're going to have you check it. And as long as there's a consultant somewhere on the premises you can ask a question for, do great. But you, you are competent to, to walk through a lot of this without being hovered over. And he began, so he began to start uh, checking and just was uh, moved rapidly through, uh, through the skill set that he needed to be a wonderful translation consultant. I was very proud of him. And he was actually queued up uh, this year, would have gone to a, uh, a, a, a workshop in Indonesia that would, that would have given him sort of this final you know, badge of approval to be a fully certified translation consultant. Just about a month before that, he uh, was promoted to his eternal reward uh, in a heart attack. And, uh, and that, uh, so his career was cut short. We, um, I miss him terribly even today. He's a wonderful friend. And, and, and his ministry, as short as it was, was truly fruitful. But he proved a concept that these kinds of people, not just North Americans, but Bible scholars in other parts of the world, could do this job and do it very freely. In some ways, they bring extra a strength because they know the language of wider communication of the country where they're serving, they know the cultures, and they often speak one of the languages that, uh, of that, of that uh, country. And so it, the, the opportunity for, uh, for synergy and for equipping people that can be very fruitful was amazing. So I, I brought this idea up uh, to some other colleagues of mine in the seed company, and it has just taken off uh, uh, this year. Uh, we had a a, uh, a workshop in Ghana that, that equipped uh, four other, four or five other uh, uh, scholars there. Uh, they will be on the road right now. It's very early, the early days, so they still need to be mentored, but they have had their first workshop and are in the process of sitting alongside a consultant to learn uh, the, the skills. They've done the same thing in Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, had 10 people there, said, here am I, send me. I have identified another fellow in Indonesia that, uh, that I'm hoping to do the same thing with, another uh, uh, seminary professor. Just came back from India where I met with a group of uh, the, the presidents of associations of seminaries, not the presidents of seminaries, but actually the head guys of two or three networks of seminaries. And in each case, I mean, the, the, the interest, uh, enthusiasm, for, for church engagement, the engagement of the theological education community in Bible translation is phenomenal. It's because Bible, of all missionary endeavors, Bible translation probably is among the most academic and rigorous uh, of, uh, of activities. And so, yeah, like, like I, I had a Skype conversation with uh, each of the, of the groups in Ghana and DRC just to give them a brief. And they just fell all over themselves saying, thank you. Thank you for inviting us to be a part of this. We have been waiting for an opportunity to use our gifts this way. So it's very exciting. I, I was praying a few weeks ago about it and, and, and felt like, God, this is, this is like a little match that's going to be dropped onto a pool of gasoline in terms of what, we, what my God is going to do in, in calling his, the, the scholars of his church to be more involved in the cause of Bible translation. Let me just give you a little bit of a profile here of what a Bible scholar uh, needs to look like. They need to be professionally competent in the biblical languages. That'd be a good exegete, good solid exegete. That's, that's absolutely uh, crucial. You have to have a learner's spirit. You can't, you know, all of us have run into people who are brilliant and they know they're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and what we need are people who are brilliant and who are humble and, and, and open to learn because the, the Bible scholar doesn't know everything they need to know in order to be able to serve a uh, translation team well. Uh, you need to be humble, amiable, 
easy to get along with. They need to understand that there are there are some power dynamics that go on, especially you know when a lot of the translators that are, are doing these translations, some of them have only high school education. A very highly educated one would have would have a bachelor's degree. That, I mean that that's it. You've got some of the gold stars. You get a bachelor's degree person translating for one of these minority languages. Most of the time, less than that. And for that person to sit across the table from someone with a doctorate, uh, the, the social distance, the di difference in power is is is, is staggering. And and if that if, if the power holder, if the guy with the doctorate, doesn't understand that and find ways of helping that uh, that translator be at ease and give them the respect they need. You're going to shut the whole thing down, and the translator will not be helped. They'll just be hopeless. And so the, the, the scholar has got to have that humble spirit and, and be able to work uh, across a, a social distance. Bible translation consultants, they need to be mentors. So, you know, as a Bible translation consultant, I want, to give, I want to give this capacity away to others and train them to do this. And I want to hold it tight. I don't want to say, I'm the only one who can do it. I want to say, here. Let me help you learn how to do this. Uh, and, and use your gifts to also participate in it. Uh, you want to be able to oversee uh, others who are doing this work and help them be successful. You know, the, the, power, or the, the metaphor that has been meant a lot to me is the, is the physician's assistant metaphor, where you have a licensed physician, a medical doctor, and then under that person in today's world, you can also have physician's assistants who don't have a medical license. But under the supervision of the agents of, the, uh, of that physician, they can do an awful lot of really good things. And, uh, and, and they can enable that physician to serve many more people very, very safely and effectively and bless a lot of people with health-related uh, uh, things because the consultant or the, 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 the doctor was willing to be to, to supervise as well as personally do things. This is a win-win. Everybody wins if in this kind of a scenario. The people group and the translators win. They get somebody who uh, they get they get service earlier, and they get and, and it's timely. It's often much more relevant if it's being done by someone from their own from their own country. The Bible scholar wins when when a Bible scholar does this kind of thing. They benefit. It's you know, they, they benefit. That person benefits as much as the uh, uh, as the people group. It's, it is there. It, it's, it is a uh, it's there is a blessing that is. is is, is sweet and lifelong for people who are involved in this. The translation consultant benefits because that the translation consultant can serve many open working book groups if they are working alongside Bible scholars who can, uh, uh, can serve some of the people groups under their supervision. And the Bible scholars institution also benefits. The Bible scholar is involved in this kind of thing, maybe over summer break, maybe at Christmas for a couple weeks. They come back and their students they are interacting with a change now going. And, it, and it, that the, the, the scholar's institution will benefit. And it's worth it for the scholar's institution to support their faculty doing this kind of work. So the new role for the Bible agencies, I think, uh, is not playing basketball. <laughs> my son, uh, this is a picture of one of my other sons. He played basketball in high school. He had a different, or he played three years, each year he played a different role on the team. The reason he played a different role is because there were different players on the team each year. And that's the situation that we have today in the world. Today, there are different players on the court than there were 50 years ago. And though there is still a role. There is still a role for North Americans to be in this task, and it is a vital role. But it's different. And we have to get it that it's different, and we have to joyfully embrace it in order to, in order to be God's service in the, in the 21st century. This is one of my favorite verses that talk about Christian leadership. When Paul enumerates the different roles in the church of leadership, he says there's one thing these people are supposed to do. They're supposed to equip God's people for works of service. It's an equipping ministry. And that's what God's calling all of us to do, is to be equippers. Calling, what he's calling the Bible agencies to do is to be equippers, not doers, but to help others to do it more effectively. So I'm going to, uh, to close there, and uh, uh, we'll welcome uh, any questions or comments. So where do we sign up? See you later. I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to. There are opportunities. The, 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 the door is open. And I'll talk to you.
what we're trying to do is, you know, I've talked about, um, you know, Chuck, we need to find ways that, that honestly, the, the, the critical issue uh, is, is more on the part of private agencies to be willing to recognize that, that they can welcome others into the task and, 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 and expand their, their ministry by doing so. Most guys who are men and women who are vital generation consultants are really good at checking verses. That's what they do, and they do it really, really well. But the idea of mentoring, of coaching, of seeing other people do this and helping them do it well, that's a harder thing for some consultants. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm preaching them, you know, turning the mirror at me and saying, you know, I need to work on, on the people that I work with to help them get, uh, get more uh, open to this. But, now you're, you're seeing, you know, the, the reality of I think where, where what we're looking at over the horizon in the next ten years. Any other questions? Yeah. Here. Uh, are there any capacity constraints? Uh, I think we got a hundred today. Could you take them? Or yeah, good question. I, I think that, it, well, I would say, yeah, capacity constraint mainly are mentors. Uh, because I, I, I don't think you can learn this well just by sitting in a workshop and then going out and doing it. I, I, you know, my experience is that having the guy sit next to me and learn by watching, and then by watching him, I, you know, this is just like the, the Jesus model, right? <laughs> and and it, it really is effective. But you have to be willing to have people who are willing to let go and learn. So that, that, that's my challenge, actually, within the Bible translation circle I'm responsible for, is to, is to get an increasing number of the, of the people that I know that know how to do this really well to be willing to get, give their expertise away. And, uh, I think it's, there's a growing number. I'm actually finding that, that, that the idea of doing this internationally with a workforce in Africa and Asia is really catching fire. And that, and, uh, and that has, uh, has tremendous momentum. I think it, it opens up a lot for a lot of opportunities because the the scholar speaks a language that will, that, that relates to direct that they can speak directly to the, the translator the, the translator. And in, in, in cases where our cases like Dr. May, he's pretty much limited to, to places where English is a language of wider communication. And he is serving extremely well in those cases in those in those situations. But there are a lot there's a lot of the world where that's not going to be adequate. And so finding other scholars I'm really looking for Chinese, actually. I'd love to see some Chinese scholars who are willing to do this. Uh, there, are, there are some interesting intercultural dynamics that uh, we need to work through, but nevertheless, a Chinese scholar could do tremendous things uh, in, uh, in China. Yes? You've talked uh, about the, the church arising around the world. Most of the funding, I, I perceive, is still coming from this part of the world. Talk to us about that. How can those of us who are here, where most of the funding has originated this project, how can we work most constructively to strengthen this movement around the world? That's a very good question. Yeah. The, uh, uh, you, you're right. The, the God's global resources financially still are largely at this point in you know, North America and Europe. Uh, in Korea, although there, you know, honestly, there are growing uh, people of means who in, in Singapore, in Indonesia, in, in uh, Nigeria who can participate. But nevertheless, I think I think that uh, that the main thing that, that that we can continue to do is to. Uh, is to be good networkers. That's what, I, that's what I've been trying to do. It, it, what, one of the things that the C company is, it tries to be is an invisible partner that links up a, a giving partner or a group of giving partners with a, with a translation project and then kind of quietly oversees that arrangement to, help, to see that, it, that, it, that it's fruitful and that everybody does what, you know, what they're committed to doing. It's a, it's a covenant relationship, actually, is, what, uh, is the way we, we put it together. Where there's a, so there's a, there's a budget, there's, there are, there's a timeline, there are goals, there are people who are committed to doing different things. And, and that proposal is given to a, a giving partner and, and if they say, yeah, I'll, you know, I, I can get behind that. I'll, I'll give so much every year to see if that happens. Then we've got a, we've got a covenant arrangement that, that is very, very fruitful. Uh, and, and the seed company can just kind of be in the background and make sure 
that the, that the prey and getting part of this information they need, and that the money goes to the uh, you know to the, to the project, and that they're being productive with it and finishing on time, doing what they what they promised. But for me, I think being an advocate, being a prayer warrior, too, goodness me, I, you know, I, the, the older I get, the more I realize how much prayer matters. And uh, I would say being prayer advocates uh, for the, uh, the people who don't yet have scripture uh, is, is, a, is a profoundly important thing. I know that the, the Bible translation uh, organizations and all of them, certainly work with, has, uh, you, know, you, know, can, you know, can communicate to people. Uh, you know, the, the remaining people groups in the world that have no scripture and uh, pray for them. I, I, I pray for one in Laos every day, you know, every day that I, 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 I got a little bit of a name on my teaching and every time I pick up the teaching, I remember the place with a lot of people in Laos asking God to bring some, in some way, make it possible for them to get scripture in their own language. But I think the prayers are really important and I would urge you both to personally be a prayer warrior and to, and to, and to invite others to be involved. Okay, silence.